have uh, quite a treat in store for us today. But before we get started, we do have an announcement, um, exciting announcement made by Lisa, if you'll tell us all about this. I'm speaking for Jack, who's out of town, but uh, he would like to invite you all to purchase a ticket for $10 to the world premiere of a new novel called Promise that is hailed as the next The Help. Um, it's set during the tornado of 1936, and the author will be here, Min Rose Gwynn, will be here with her New York publicist. Um, and Tupelo has outbid Oxford and Square Books for the honor of launching this book, so we need to have a good crowd. And the date is Wednesday, February 28th, from 5 to 7 at the Lyric, which, was, as you know, was the hospital during the tornado. And refreshments and beverages will be served, and the author uh, will speak as well, and some other Tupelo folks who have some, some memories of the, of the tornado will speak from the stage. And she'll be signing her first edition book. And the book will go national that day. So please help us celebrate and come this exciting, it's a very exciting time for Tupelo as a national literary hub. And I think, Jane, is Susan here today? Do you know selling tickets? Oh, there she is back there, has some tickets. They'll be sold here today and later at the Gumtree Books. So hope you all come. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Today, the featured book is uh, about Fanny Crook, and the author is a Tupelo, another Tupelo native, Dorothy Sample Sean, and um, she is now deceased, of course, but I think she has a lot of her classmates here today. If you are a classmate of Dorothy's, raise your hand. <laughs> that was a... Um, Quite a smart um, class that year, I'm sure. Um, anyway, I have read a lot that Dorothy has written, and um, she, she was a wonderful writer, very gifted writer, and a lovely person, too. She's very dear. Uh, the, the book she wrote uh, was taken by two, two uh, smart ladies, Libby Hartfield and Marion Barnwell, and they were the uh, editors of the book, and they put this together and took it to University Press and got it published. So um, that was quite an accomplishment. Uh, Libby Hartful, Hartfield is the retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. She is a biologist and a science educator, and she is the co-host of the popular program Creature Comforts on public radio. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not. It's one of my favorites. Uh, Marion Barnwell is a uh, professor emerita from the Division of Languages and Literature at Delta State University, and she compiled and edited the anthology A Place Called Mississippi and co-authored Touring Literary Miss Mississippi. And the portrayer of Fanny Cook is Dr. Kathy Shropshire. There are a lot of smart women here today, I'll tell you what. Uh, and she is a wildlife biologist and is retired from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And she served for over 11 years as executive director of the Mississippi Wildlife Federation. Um, thank you, ladies, for coming, and we're looking forward to this. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Fanny Cook, the eminent scientist and conservationist. She's a native of Crystal Springs. She earned her baccalaureate degree from the Mississippi University for Women and did graduate studies at George Washington University and the University of Colorado. She spearheaded an extensive grassroots movement throughout the state of Mississippi that culminated in the formation of the Mississippi Game and Fish Commission in 1932. We now know of it as the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. She is uh, a few years after she founded the the agency. She. Uh, also started a museum within the agency, and she served as the director until she retired many years later. She's responsible for much of the comprehensive research and for many of the first publications about the plants and animals of Mississippi. Today, Ms. Cook is here to share with us the story of um, 
her adventures as a pioneering woman ecologist in the wilds of Mississippi and in the halls of politics. So help me welcome Ms. Cook. Thank you, Ms. Hartfield. I appreciate that. I was asked to come here today to tell you about the creation of the Mississippi Game and Fish Commission and the State Wildlife Museum. Well, I think to tell that story, it's best to just begin at the beginning. I was born July 19th, 1889, the seventh of ten children in Crystal Springs. In 1907, I enrolled in the Industrial Institute in college. You would know it as Mississippi University for Women. The Institute was established in 1884 as a place where the daughters of poor white farming families could get an education and thus better themselves. I received my normal degree. I set out for a year and taught, and then I went back and got my Bachelor of Arts degree in History and English in 1911. I continued my studies of history and English when I went to summer school at the University of Colorado in Boulder in 1913. And I taught those subjects in West Point and Louisville and Beauregard, Mississippi. In 1915, I joined my sister Lena May and her husband George in Panama. George was involved with the construction of the Panama Canal and I taught at the St. Cristobal High School for two years. And in 1917, I went to Lander, Wyoming, where I was the principal of the high school for a year. But in 1918, I joined my sisters, Lenny Jewell, Vivian, and Nina May and George in Washington, D.C. There I worked for the IRS for six years. <laughs> now, while I was working for the IRS, I enrolled in the College of Arts and Sciences at George Washington University to pursue my advanced degree in ornithology. I was 34 years old. As part of a student project, I had to review the publications related to Mississippi wildlife, and I was shocked at how little information I could find. It seems that in 1850, the Mississippi legislature had approved a plant and animal survey for the state, and it was to be housed at the University of Mississippi. E.L.C. Wales undertook that work, and he and his brother had collected with John James Oliver when he was in the Natchez district, so he was well qualified. And using his collections and the collections of other noted naturalists of the day, in 1854, he produced a report on the flora, mammals, birds, fish, and mollusks of Mississippi. Well, it was quite an incomplete report, and I was disappointed that most of the specimens that were used to make those determinations were no longer available for those of us who might wish to follow up on that early work. I also discovered that over 60 years later, in 1921, E.N. Lowe produced a report on the flowering plants and ferns of Mississippi. And these two documents were the sum total of the professional publications on the flora and fauna of Mississippi. Well, I vowed then to do something about that. And what I envisioned was a plant and animal survey similar to what I had seen in Washington, D.C. at the biological survey there, where collectors went out and collected specimens and recorded the location and something of their abundance. And I envisioned a program of conservation education. Well, I continued my studies, and over the next two years, I collected in Mississippi from one end to the other. And it was then that I discovered what a sad state of affairs we had here. Droughts, fires, game hogs, unlicensed trappers, they all seemed to buy to see which could take the greatest toll of wildlife. And worse, public indifference. And the fact that there was no agency or organization that was authorized or required to enforce game laws. Well, the counties could do it, but they rarely did. And it was then that I realized even if we had a plant and animal survey, there was no place to house that information where it would be used for conservation purposes. And I realized what we needed was an emergency education program to explain to people the importance of the conservation and proper use of our natural resources and that would lead to improved legislation and to an agency that would enforce conservation laws and undertake research and surveys. So I made a decision and I left Washington, and I left my studies, and I returned to Mississippi in 1926. With the 
help of my family, especially my brother William Daniel, he was a representative at the time, we proposed legislation to create a game and fish agency. Well, it seemed like a simple task, it was such a clear need for this agency. But this was my first experience with the legislative process. <laughs> the legislation failed and I was disappointed. But then I remembered what was written about me in my college yearbook. Fanny knows not the meaning of failure. For her, failure is merely incentive for more earnest striving. Well, I, I realized what we needed was more people to help push this idea forward. So at my own expense, I began traveling the state and giving talks and lectures and setting up exhibits and displays and explaining the need for this conservation agency. And a, a major step forward was taken in 1927 when I created the Mississippi Association for the Conservation of Wildlife while I was at the Agricultural College where I had an office. And Dr. Harnard was the president and I was the executive secretary. And over the next six years, every constructive thinking person in Mississippi was given an opportunity to support this idea of a conservation agency. And over the next six years, this became the focus of my life undertaken with no salary. Well, we did get support for our idea. We got support from the plant board and the board of education and teachers association and PTAs and hunting and fishing clubs and garden clubs and the American Legion, Federation of Women's Clubs and Forestry Association. And in 1928, with the support of the speaker of the house, Thomas Bailey, we once again proposed legislation, but again it failed. But in 1928, something else happened. Aldo Leopold, who's known as the father of game management in the U.S., came to Mississippi to conduct a game survey. I'd like to read just a short portion from his report. By and large, small game conditions are fair and big game, deer and turkey, are bad. The present game supply, except for a few private preserves, is so far the result of accident rather than design. There is no state game department and only the beginnings of a conservation movement. There is no refuge system and little law enforcement. While there are beginnings of game management on a few preserves, the rank and file are still a long way from either wanting it or understanding it. There is one offset to all these defects, a widespread and intense popular interest in game and hunting. In this respect, Mississippi excels any other state so far surveyed. The capitalization on this interest, utilizing all available educational agencies, including the far-flung and powerful organizations for agricultural extension, is the only hope for maintaining a game supply in the face of the process of industrialization now underway throughout the South. Well, with this added information from this respected biologist, we continued to get support. And well, what we promised was more sports for the sportsmen and more fish in the streams and more flowering plants in the fields and forests and more songbirds and more beneficial hawks and owls that would eat the rats and mice in the fields. And we promised refuges and preserves and maybe most importantly, more men and women and boys and girls who loved the outdoors and went there with seeing eyes and hearing ears. Well, we continued to get support, and in 1932, we once again proposed legislation. Now, on January 19, 1932, in the midst of the worst depression we'd ever known, Martin S. Connor was made governor of Mississippi. He said, we assume our duties at a time when men are filled with doubts and fears and wondering if civilization itself is about to crumble. Oh, indeed, things were bad in Mississippi. The state was bankrupt. Many people were without jobs. Colleges were no longer accredited. And to address this, Connor proposed cutting back on state services and state employees. But he also said, again, I'd like to read just a short portion from his address. No generation holds fee simple title to the fertility of the soil, the wealth of the forest, the fish and game of the streams in the woods or the minerals and clays that lie buried in the earth or outcrop upon its surface. We hold these blessings of nature for reasonable use and enjoyment and in trust for our successors. 
and we have no moral right to rob our descendants by wastefully depleting or recklessly destroying them. It is the legitimate function and service and the sacred duty of every government to conserve these natural resources. My friend Lucy Howarth and 16 other representatives introduced House Bill 116 to create a game and fish agency. On March 1st, 1932, that legislation passed. A few days later, the Senate passed it and the governor signed it into law. And the dream that I'd had back in 1926 was about to come true. Why did I think I could do it? Well, I, I guess I just inherited a stubborn streak from my father. It was said in my family, if you want to talk about real stubbornness, you said stubborn as G.M. Cook. Yes, I, I believe I must have inherited some of that. Well, with the passage of this bill, I wrote to Dr. Paul Barsh at the Natural History Museum in Washington. He had been my instructor at George Washington and a constant center of support to me in my quest, and I told him I had been told I could have any position I wanted in this new agency. And I thought about Southern Commissioner, but that was an unpaid position, and I had already worked for six years without pay, and I needed a salary. I thought about state conservationist, but I didn't want the law enforcement problems that would come with that. No, I, I thought perhaps director of research and education might fit, and what did he think? Again, I'd like to read just a short portion from his letter to me. If you were a man, any of the statutory positions would answer, but women are difficult problems to place. <laughs> of course, you won't like that, but the fact still remains, and we have to face it. You can't change a woman into a man by fiat, and probably if we could, we'd prefer to have them as they are. But I think as director of research and education, you would do a splendid work for your state. And what's more, you are eminently qualified to undertake that work. So good luck to you. That summer, the agency borrowed $1,500 to get started because they were to work from license sales. And of course, they sold no licenses yet. And in September, I was hired as research assistant at the age of 43. Now, one of the first projects we undertook was a fishery stocking program, and another was a game survey conducted by the game wardens. We gave them forms, and they were to record the game animals they saw, and where they saw them, and how many they saw, and this would provide somewhat of an index of abundance that would help with setting seasons and bag limits, and we had forms for commercial fishermen and also for the trappers for them to record not only their take, but also their revenue. But in 1935, the Works Project Administration, a program of the New Deal, approached the agency and wanted to know if we had a program that would put people to work. Well, I was given that assignment, and I had the perfect project. A statewide plant and animal survey, a series of museums across the state, and a program of conservation education. I received support for this idea from the biology departments at the colleges and junior colleges. They would provide space and also expertise. Well, the project was approved, and the dream that I'd had back in 1923 was about to become a reality. At the height of that project, we employed over 500 people in positions such as classroom instructor and collector and preparer and artist and photographer and carpenter and taxidermist and field instructor. We had 18 regional museums, mostly in colleges and junior colleges, but also in four high schools. We collected nearly 67,000 specimens and cataloged 50,000. We created nearly 43,000 casts and 1,000 paintings and drawings and 4,000 photographs. We reached nearly 70,000 children in the classroom and many thousand more in the camps that we held and 285,000 heard talks and lectures and nearly 400,000 people saw our exhibits and displays at fairs and other venues. Oh, it was no easy task to train and retrain the people who undertook the advanced and very careful work required of the biological survey. And had it not been for their optimistic and determined spirit and the sympathetic cooperation of the WPA officials and the biologists, it would not have happened. 
But for those who were privileged to work on this ambitious and cooperative program, well, they came away with a, a new appreciation for the environment and the realization that all citizens are responsible for the conservation of our natural resources. And that it is somewhat of a religion in that they began to appreciate God's handiwork. Well, with the close of this project, I wanted to establish a state museum in Jackson. And we did that when we acquired a condemned, abandoned building on the old asylum grounds on North State Street. We reworked exhibits and moved them in and moved the collections in. And I was made the museum director. And it was known as the State Wildlife Museum. And within the first month, we had visitors from 32 Mississippi towns and seven states. Over the years, I, I worked on many publications related to the fauna of Mississippi on white-tailed deer, beaver, or wild turkey, publications using the biological specimens, the alligators and lizards of Mississippi, the game birds of Mississippi, the game animals of Mississippi, the fur resources of Mississippi, the snakes of Mississippi, many other publications and papers. And Oh, I did enjoy the field work that went with that. And I had many exciting and thrilling experiences. You know, walking into a swamp filled with alligators and cottonmouth moccasins to get to a heronry where we would find not only herons, but Louisiana water turkeys and bitterns and rails and gallinules and greaves and where we would collect or band or photograph these. It was rise to feelings of both fear and exhilaration not to be found by any other experience. <coughs> And I remember once finding a large diamondback rattlesnake hibernating with a gopher tortoise deep underground. I was often accompanied by game wardens on these trips. And oh, I know they thought I was a strange old lady. <laughs> Here I was in my 50s out there wading in these streams and creeks and staining fish and putting them in a jar. And well, we never did get one big enough to eat. <laughs> then at lunch, I'd sit on a log and eat my sardines and crackers with the warden. <laughs> but I remember once in the Delta we were collecting and I, I shot a bird and it fell in the water and the warden refused to get it. He said it was too cold and he didn't want to get wet. I said, well then turn around. And I stripped down to my teddies and I walked out there in my step-ins and I got that bird. <laughs> I always did say there wasn't anything under the sun a man could do, a woman couldn't do better. <laughs> It was said I had a love affair with nature, and I suppose I did. I had an annual appointment in the Gulf of Mexico to greet the migratory birds as they returned from South America. I would go out in a little boat past the farthest island so that I would be the first thing the birds saw as they flew in. An old maid in her 50s, not missing a thing. And the birds would land on the boat and on me, and I would give them water, and I banded many. Together we would go back to shore. Some of those birds returned to my hand year after year. And on a, a spring morning, in quest of wild turkey, to walk into a woods of pine and oak along a stream fed by a spring, and to hear a chorus of songbirds above fills one with an ecstasy of living. But I had work in the museum as well, and there I gave talks to visitors and tours of the museum, and I worked on exhibits and pamphlets and activity programs, and I kept up a correspondence on everything from lamprey eels to pileated woodpeckers, and I continued to work on my publications and papers, and I helped others use the collections for their research. Well, by 1951, the museum was in bad shape, but by 1955, we had to move because they were going to demolish that building. And well, they should have. Doors and windows didn't fit, the roof leaked. It was all the staff could do, me and the secretary and the maid, Alice, just to keep the rats and mice and insects out of the collections. Oh, it was unsightly and unsanitary and not fit for occupancy. Well, it was a fire hazard, and of course we had no fire insurance. And it was always cold in winter. There was no heat in the exhibit hall or storage area, so it was uncomfortable for both staff and visitors. <laughs> definitely needed a new building. And I, I had a dream of a museum because 
Well, we had the exhibits with the painted backgrounds and taxidermied specimens that showed the animal in its native habitat, and you needed to be able to stand back to really appreciate them, and they had glass fronts, so they needed special lighting. And we had the cast of reptiles and amphibians, and they were on tables covered with glass or cabinets covered with glass, and they needed to be lit appropriately. And we had the biological collections, the skins and skulls of mammals and skins of birds and alcoholic specimens and the field notes that went with them. And it was the most complete collection of native wildlife in any state. And the agency used the material and others used the material and it needed to be housed appropriately. And we needed aquariums to show the fishes of Mississippi and we needed a library and a reading room and an auditorium for conservation education programs. And we needed offices and a professional staff and salaries to match that professional work. Well, at the same time I was preparing for that move, I moved from the home where I had lived with Miss Eudora Welty and her mother for nearly 15 years. Oh, more opposite women had probably never shared a home before. <laughs> you know, I don't think they ever got used to finding a hawk in the bathtub or an owl in the refrigerator or a baby fox spending the night or to get a phone call that said, tell Miss Cook Mr. Tackett is out of the swamp. <laughs> I remember once Miss Eudora helped me get a baby bat out of the curtains. We, we got the bat and I fed it with a dropper and when it belched, you should have seen her face. <laughs> well, well, we did move. We moved to a building on North Jefferson Street across from the fairgrounds. We rented the building from the fair commission and oh, it was better than what we had. We had a place for the exhibits and a separate area for collections and an auditorium and offices and we got heat. And within the first year we had a 500% increase in our visitors. But I didn't view it as the permanent home for the museum. In 1958 at the age of 69 I collected my last fish. That same year after 26 years with the agency and 32 since I'd begun my quest to create that agency. I retired from the game and fish because retirement was mandatory at age 70. But I was not finished yet and I continued to work on the freshwater fishes of Mississippi and when it was published in 1959 I was made a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science noting not only my work with fishes but also mammals and birds and reptiles and amphibians and even plants. Well, I was quite proud of that because I always regretted not completing my advanced degree. But over the next five years I continued to work on publications and papers and I reworked previous publications and I continued to lead field trips from Tishomingo County to the Gulf of Mexico. Because of my love, love of birds in 1955 I would organized the Mississippi Ornithological Society and served as its first president. And I always enjoyed leading field trips for men and women who loved the outdoors and went there with seeing eyes and hearing ears. And I enjoyed leading field trips for students and scouts. I'd helped scouts with their nature badge for years. Well, I had a reputation among the scouts as being tough. I wouldn't sign off on their badges till they mastered the material. The last field trip I led was with a group of scouts on April 29th. 1964. Fanny Cook died on April 30th, 1964. The next month, the Mississippi Legislature passed a resolution recognizing Cook's accomplishments and naming her museum, the Wildlife Museum, the Fanny A. Cook Memorial. Then in 1971, the Mississippi Legislature appropriated funds for a new building on the side of Cook's Museum on Jefferson Street by the fairgrounds and officially named the new facility the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, the Fannie A. Cook Memorial, under B.E. Gandy's directorship. I joined the staff as education coordinator. Later, I became director, and then in the year 2000, we opened the new museum in LaFleur's Bluff, incorporating a 300-acre natural area to more fully realize Fanny's dream. Uh, she had always wanted a place of scientific research and conservation education, an active museum. Now, led by Charles Knight and his fine staff, Fanny's dream is still alive, challenging citizens to take responsibility for conservation. 
And now it is, again, my pleasure to make an introduction, this time of Kathy Shropshire. Uh, she brought us Fanny Cook today, and she's uh, um, a wildlife biologist, as, as Margaret uh, mentioned. She has degrees from um, University of Mississippi, Texas Tech, and Mississippi State University. She retired from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks that Ms. Cook had founded. As she worked for 25 years, and she started out as a mammologist in the museum, working with Ms. Cook's collections. Uh, later, after she got her PhD, she moved on to be a wildlife biologist and worked uh, for years on the recovery of black bear in the state. Then she went on to be the museum's wildlife heritage program director, and then uh, led the, the Wildlife Federation for almost a dozen years. And now, um, retired from that job, she still works a good bit for the Federation, does a lot of conservation work, uh, is on the board at the Clinton Nature Center, and she travels the state being Miss Cook. <laughs> so, um, yes, it's, I'm going to turn it over to you. Now, Kathy, Dr. Shropshire, if you can help here. So, so, if you have any questions, <laughs> we have the expert here on Miss Cook, and I know what I know based on what I've written, but, uh, but it is really wonderful to bring Fanny, hopefully, to life to people across the state. It's been, um, it's been interesting how many people don't know anything about Ms. Cook. And so with this presentation and also the book, we're hoping that we can reach a lot more people, especially now, about women's issues. And we had strong women back in the, back in the day. Back, she barely had the ability to vote, so she was a, a strong person and somebody that uh, was a force to be reckoned with. But if you have any questions for either me or Libby or Marion, anybody? You want to go ahead and introduce Marion? Let's give Marion. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah. And again, Margaret introduced Marion to some degree, but uh, Marion is retired emeritus professor from Delta State. And she was a good, good friend of Dorothy Sean. So I'm going to give you Marion. Well, my other claim to fame is that my mother was from Tupelo. <laughs> and so I'm so happy to be here. My, my people were the Clarks, the Bakers, and the Trices, if that means anything <laughs> to you. Uh, it should mean something to Frances Joyner, because her mother, Frances Joyner, am I whistling? Her mother, Frances Joyner, was my mother's best friend. And my mother didn't live to be 102. And so when my mother died, Frances Joyner, the elder, had Dorothy and me come to Tupelo and gave us a tour of all the things that they did together growing up, my mother and Frances did growing up. She'd usually say something like, this is where the school was, <laughs> or this is where we hung out. So she was a great, uh, and she saved all the letters my mother wrote her, and she turned them over to me, so that was just wonderful. But going back to Dorothy, who actually wrote this book on Fanny Cook, I was teaching at Delta State. I had been teaching there for two years when Jar Dorothy joined the faculty and became my colleague. And then 10 years later, she became chair of the department, and she became my boss. But neither of those designations are, are really the thing because Dorothy and I were great buddies, dearest friends for over 30 years. And we traveled to conferences together. We had family holidays together. We did a whole lot together. And those of you who know Dorothy, knew Dorothy, know that she was always a friend. I mean, you just didn't know Dorothy without being her best friend. So when she died in 2014 without having finished this book that she was working on for so long and so diligently, I knew that I would do anything I could to see that it got published. Well, what I didn't know was that Libby felt the same way, and so did Leela Salisbury, then head of University Press of Mississippi. Well, it was Margaret Ann, I found out, Dorothy's sister, Margaret Ann, who put two and two together and called Leela Salisbury and said, I think that these two ladies that could probably finish this book for you. 
the, the manuscript had already been through the editorial process. It had been through two readers, and Dorothy had incorporated the suggestions that the readers had made. And so she was really in the final stages of the book when she died. So we went to University Press, uh, Libby and I, and met with Libby um, Salisbury and Craig Gill, who was getting ready to take her place, and his assistant, Emily Bandy, and hashed out who would do what. And Libby had worked with Dorothy very closely on the material and had shared the material at the museum. Uh, I knew a little bit about editing and documentation, so we kind of divided up our, uh, our work. We knew that Libby was going to supply the photographs and I would do the documentation. And that was kind of the way we thought it would work. But Libby and I became good friends and it became really a collaborative effort, and, which made it a lot more fun and we thoroughly enjoyed doing the book, finishing it up. Dorothy had a mission. Uh, one, she had several missions, but one of her missions was to um, look around Mississippi in particular at women who had been underappreciated in their time. Uh, unlike this, the Dr. Barsh that was mentioned, she didn't find it difficult to place women at all. And so she wrote books about that. Uh, one of the, the first book that she wrote was, and I know a lot of you have this book, Lizzie, which is a novel based on the life of Governor Earl Brewer's daughter, who was a lively, fiery woman who couldn't stay a governor's daughter in, in that neat little box. She had many plans and, that would upset her father. One of which was she was a, a head of, she, she started a feminist newspaper in Clarksdale, Mississippi in the 1930s, which did not go over well with many people. This, was, this book would have been a bestseller if the press that published it had not folded soon after they published this book. I have no doubt that it would have been a bestseller. It's out of print, unfortunately. The second book, and that was 1995, the second book she published was co-authored with Martha Swain, and this is about Judge Lucy Howorth, who was in Cleveland, born in Greenville, grew, uh, lived in Cleveland. Uh, she was a New Deal lawyer. She was elected to the Mississippi House of Representatives. Her mother was the first woman to be elected to the House of Representatives, so she had a little bit of a legacy there. And as you heard in Kathy's speech, uh, Judge Lucy was instrumental in that bill to preserve the wildlife and, and conservation in Mississippi. And then the third book, I'm trying to, oh, bell under here. The third book that Dorothy published was uh, about a, a woman living in, still lives in Cleveland, who is a self-taught artist, Carolyn Norris. And she is a housekeeper for many of the faculty members of Delta State. Uh, she was Dorothy's housekeeper, but that doesn't define their roles either. They were best friends. And this book is just a wonderful collection of uh, Carolyn Norris's paintings. And it came out in, 19, in, in 2011. So Dorothy was busy celebrating these women. I came across a quote the other day by Ursula Le Guin. And she said, this phase of the women's movement is best accomplished by, quote, steady, resolute, morally committed action. And that reminded me of Dorothy, because she steadily and resolutely wrote about these women who needed to be further recognized and remembered. So we need to celebrate these women and salute these women, and we also need to celebrate Dorothy. Thank you. And now I think we can do questions, if y'all have any.